Hej, jag heter Gustavus Adolfus den andra. And I'm Joachim from Sabaton. Because we've been lying to them for the last year and a half. Yeah, apparently. Yeah, lying. We've mm. been lying to you. And in fact, all the history we've been doing, it's not even real history, <laughs> actually. Wait, yeah. wait, Chris, come here. Chris, yeah, Chris. Chris, come here. Chris, can you do the interview for the about this one? You want to do the interview? But you, 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 okay, got, you got a lunch meeting anyway. So, yeah, I got a so, lunch meeting. Okay, so you well, want to take over? Well, Chris, you sit down and I'll, okay? Yeah. All right, Joachim, okay, great to see well, you again, buddy. You All right, too, cool, yeah. This is Sabaton History. famous physician and alchemist Paracelsus made a prophecy towards the end of his life in the mid-1500s that one day a lion of midnight would arise. He would go out to fight the eagle from the south and defeat the enemies of Christ and their agents of destruction. The lion would then win the eagle's scepter and usher in an era of peace in Europe. And soon after his victory, the world would cease to exist. By the time the Swedish king Charles IX, Karl de Nionde, died in 1611, the 16 year old heir, Gustavus Adolphus, could not have been further away from fulfilling such a prophecy. His father had left him a legacy of three ongoing wars and the smoldering embers of a civil war, which had sent the Catholic line of the royal family into exile. To add insult to injury, although the Swedish Riksdag declared Gustav fit to rule despite his age, he was only allowed control of the government if his reign was accompanied by a strong chancellor, so the nobleman Axel Oxenjuana was chosen to assist the young king. What could have easily been problematic proved to be the perfect partnership. Gustav Adolf showed all the signs of a gifted leader early on. His charisma was infectious, and he easily won over the Swedish people from the highest nobleman to the lowest servant. It was his dreams of greatness and seemingly endless ambition that inspired the people to follow him. Oxenjuerna, on the other hand, was the born administrator and bureaucrat who preferred attending to matters of the state from the depths of his personal library. Together, the two overcame years of civil strife to reform the nation and modernize the military. While Gustav Adolf learned military matters, Oxenjuerna talked business with the Swedish aristocracy. The two sought to open Sweden to the world. Sweden's handicap of being situated on the periphery of Europe with only limited natural resources was hardly the basis for an empire. But with international trade came international credit and with credit came the ability to pay for an army. Sweden had virtually no allies and was seen by the European aristocrats as an upstart backwards country full of unknown wilderness and barbarians. But there was a need to counter both Polish and Danish threats to his rule, and Gustav wanted to continue what his father had begun and create a Protestant Swedish empire on the shores of the Baltic Sea. Fast forward some years. When the Thirty Years' War was a third of its way through, the Catholic imperial forces of the Habsburg Emperor were rapidly advancing into northern Germany. Denmark's intervention in the confessional conflict as the champion of Protestantism was rather short-lived and the Danes' defeat in 1629 ended their status as a real power. Gustav Adolf, who had spent the last few years fighting a tough war in Poland, was at first delighted by the defeat of his Scandinavian rival, but tensions grew with Catholic armies now at all the edges of his newly emerging empire. His family, the Vasa dynasty, had made political connections with the German royal families in the north, and Gustav Adolf himself had married the Protestant princess of Brandenburg. But fears of a Catholic Habsburg-Polish alliance directed against Gustav Adolf's throne became more pressing. When the besieged city of Stralsund asked the Swedes for help, Gustav Adolf felt like he had no real choice but to get involved. And the Thirty Years' War then grew into a battle between the lion from the north and the eagle from the south. The decision to get involved in the German conflict was nothing but a gamble. Sweden had only recently conquered major cities and territories along the Baltic coast and was running out of money. 
Oxenjuana calculated they would need an army of at least 75,000 men to take and hold the north of the Germanic states. But in late 1630, they could only muster around 30,000. So although this was more than Gustav had ever led in Poland, he would need all of his military skills to be successful. The overwhelming Swedish victory in the Battle of Weitenfeld in 1631, though, changed the image of the Swedes overnight. Gustav Adolf rose from unknown king to European sensation. The Protestants hailed him as their savior, as the new Alexander, the lion from the north, the golden king. As quickly as possible, he led his army south, capturing wealthy German cities on the way until he stood before the Rhine. As he entered Frankfurt, where traditionally Germanic kings and emperors went for their coronation, the people of Europe began to speculate about the real size of Gustav Adolf's ambitions, even as the size of his army grew and grew. See, back when he was crowned as Gustav den Andre Adolf, he had entered the coronation ceremony in a symbolic manner. He was dressed as a goth. And no, I don't mean someone in a black leather coat and tons of mascara. I mean, you know, like badass goths from ancient times who went out to sack Rome. Would he now make this a reality? and march on the capital of Christendom. The Catholics feared and hated the Swedish king as the spawn of Satan himself. They portrayed his host as a horde of Laplanders riding reindeer into battle, or exotic Scottish barbarians, and Finlanders who possessed magical powers that could change the weather. Gustav did little to combat those rumors, and since he took over the imperial postal monopoly, he began distributing his own propaganda throughout the empire, stylizing himself as a savior and a just ruler with little imperial ambition. This, of course, shaped the legends about him even further. In reality, his short-term goals were rather mundane. He had to pay his giant new army, which was draining his finances. If the champion of Protestantism had to strong-arm his new Protestant friends for contributions or seize their territory for profit, so be it. His friendship had a price, and if cities did not want Swedish troops to show up for a surprise visit at their gates, they better pay their feudal dues to the man. In the long term, though, he wanted to be rid of the Catholic influence that threatened his northern empire. Rome was of no interest to him, nor the extinction of Catholicism or of the Holy Roman Empire, but he was still marching south. Oxenjuana urged caution. The march so far south was a huge risk for the overstretched Swedish army. Although they had plundered many rich cities along the way, it was their northern power base which was now pretty unprotected. Oxenjuana feared an endless war, one which Sweden seemed like it might have been dragged into. Gustav Adolf had given the Imperials a bloody nose, yeah, sure, but they were far from defeated. Even after five more major battles and a large number of smaller engagements, the war did not reach a conclusion. By 1632, Gustav Adolf's forces marched into the imperial homelands, advancing as far as Munich and laying siege to Nuremberg. But Gustav had made a strategic blunder. While they were busy in the south, the imperial general Wallenstein outmaneuvered the Swedes and marched north, raiding deep into the territory of Sweden's Saxon ally. This threatened to cut off the whole communications line and forced Gustav Adolf to race north after Wallenstein. It was already November and his troops were pretty exhausted from the campaign, but he hoped that another Breitenfeld would get rid of imperial power in the north once and for all. With Gustav's host approaching, Wallenstein halted his troops near Lutzen, a small town near Leipzig. The imperials were initially fewer in number, under 17,000 men and 20 heavy guns strong but they had chosen an advantageous spot between marshes and fortified Lutzen. Gustav Adolf brought more than 19,000 men and 60 heavy guns with him and ordered the attack. 
the Swedish king, was well known as a brilliant innovator of modern tactics and military techniques. Early on, he had studied military theory of Walhausen and Maurice, implementing the new ideas from the United Provinces. In a checkerboard formation, he moved his pike and shot brigades forward, flanked by the heavy Swedish cavalry. At first, it seemed like the Swedes were claiming another easy victory. The imperial left wing gave way under the pressure of the Swedish heavy cavalry, and only the timely arrival of reinforcements saved Wallenstein from disaster. The town of Lützen was set on fire to stop the Swedes from taking it. But strong winds blew the heavy smoke right onto the battlefield. Soon, with all the smoke of the discharged guns as well, it became nearly impossible to see and direct the battle from afar especially for the near-sighted Swedish king. It was a fierce and brutal battle, with both sides suffering heavy casualties and several units breaking and fleeing the field. In the center, the Swedish infantry threw itself repeatedly against the entrenched imperial musketeers, paying a bloody price. So to rally and support his troops, Gustav Adolf and his bodyguards rode out onto the field. They joined the advance on the right wing, but with the smoke, and the overall chaos of battle, Gustav soon got lost in the confusion. Suddenly, he was hit by a musket shot, crushing the bones in his left arm. Then his horse got hit in the neck, reeling out of control. Gustav's master of horse tried to lead his king away from the imperial lines as they were rushed by a squadron of enemy horsemen. Pistols were fired at close range, and a chaotic melee ensued. A discharge burned the face of his protector, who lost his grip on the Swedish king. Gustav Adolf was hit by another ball and stabbed by a sword. He fell to the ground. Unaware of the king's fate, the battle raged on all afternoon. Once more, the Swedes renewed their attacks against Lützen, finally throwing the Imperials out. Wallenstein lost his nerve as his flanks buckled, ordering a general retreat. By the evening, as the battle subsided, the search for the Swedish king began. The search party spotted the king's riderless horse and began inspecting the dead bodies on the ground. After a long search, Gustav Adolf was finally found. Mutilated by several stab wounds and with a bullet wound in the temple, he lay there among the nameless dead. His armor and possessions had been looted from his lifeless corpse. The Swedes at first tried to hide their king's fate by putting his body in a wagon, but rumors soon circulated. Both sides had lost thousands of men in the Battle of Lützen, but although it was the Imperials who had quit the field first, the death of Gustavus Adolphus likely had the greatest impact on the course of the war. He had not just been the Swedish king. He was a living legend, the lion, the child of prophecy. Soldiers were proud to follow the rightful king in the north just to be part of his legend. But now, who was to lead them? Did Sweden's imperial dreams and ambitions die with Gustav? Destiny, it seemed, had taken a different path than the prophecy had suggested. Well, Chris, it's great to have you here once again. <laughs> oh, thank you. That's nice of you to have me. <laughs> As you know, most of you know, this is not, of course, Chris. This is, in fact, Joachim. Now, but with a lot of bands, now I know that when I was a, you know, especially when I was a teenager and stuff, I had favorite bands. You had their albums. You had pictures of them all. But sometimes you would get the wrong name assigned to the wrong person because maybe, you, you know, you hadn't read a lot of, there was no internet and stuff. And yeah, and sometimes they messed it up in the booklet with the, at the artist. This is true. Yeah. And so, you know, and, uh, you know, a couple of them, there's certain genres of music where you'll have like people who will all dress exactly the same so it, you can, they can be a little interchangeable. Now, I'm going to use this because you do actually have quite distinct look from the rest of your, actually most of you guys do. So, but you're, you're the short haired guy. You're the guy with like the creepy facial hair and stuff. Um, 
something <laughs> creepy guy. What the <laughs> With the reflective sunglasses, so in case there's porn showing on the monitors, everybody yeah. in the audience, everybody in the audience can see that. But but you do have a distinctive look, so I don't think that would happen to you particularly often, especially because you're the lead singer. But that leads me to asking something. Do you ever get confused about, uh, like, say, lyrics between one song and another song and stuff when you're... Yes, um, especially when it comes to this album, Carol's X, yeah. and all the songs on it, because they're available in both Swedish and English. True. And uh, that makes a huge difference, actually. Okay. Uh, I... I don't remember how many times, so like, yeah, this song, Lion from the North, I remember clearly, I can't remember if we were doing it originally uh, in that night in Swedish or English, but let's say I did, we sang it in English and I ran off for the guitar solo, yeah. and when I come back for the bridge part yeah. and clap along, and I'm starting to sing Swedish and I change the language. Yeah. And everybody else is like, what the f <laughs> Does the audience have a problem with that, do you think, or are they just like, oh, oh okay. No. Uh, <laughs> uh, most of the times, I mean, people know. Most people know that it's available in both languages, yeah. so people are usually laughing about it. But it's happened like four or five times. And I also during, I mean, Carol is next, one of our most popular songs. Yeah, uh, I've sung it. I don't know how many times in both languages. But sometimes I get afraid of getting it wrong that I black out. Oh. So I've actually had, you know, all embrace me. It's my Stockholm. Wow. <laughs> I don't know where to go. So, yeah, sometimes that only me being afraid of making that mistake will cause me to make mistakes. <laughs> what you could do, you could do what uh, Uwe Turnquist uh, has to do. Since, okay, now you guys have written a lot of songs. Uh, he's 91 years old now, right? Because <laughs> he's, he's a Swedish artist. He was, he was big starting in the 50s. He was like the first rock star in Sweden in like 1954, 55. And he's 91 and he still tours. And I know that he does this because I play the piano on his on his 90th birthday tour, which was really fun playing for a bunch of 80 year olds and stuff. But uh, you know, I'm a little behind, so he's got a little monitor, and he has really bad vision with gigantic letters of all of his texts coming up and stuff because he's written something like 800 songs, and <laughs> oh. it's and and. A lot of these songs that we're doing were written in the 1950s or the early 1960s. And I don't mean just like, that. of course, he's going to remember all the words to the hits and stuff, but he really needs that. Um, now, I think you've mentioned this before, but I don't remember. I know uh, when you play these songs from Carolus Rex in Sweden, you play them in Swedish. Yes. How often do you do the Swedish versions abroad? It depends on the language capabilities on that country and what kind of language they're speaking there. Uh, we've noticed that... Uh, well, present company uh, excluded, but uh, Americans and British people are a bit handicapped when it comes to second and third languages. It's true. Yep. <laughs> um, Some of them are handicapped when it comes to first languages. <laughs> Insert drum roll. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, there goes five patrons from America. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> In America and Britain, so they, oh, yeah. they don't like the Swedish version. No, exactly, uh, because they're so used to everything being in English. Yeah, uh, we did on a couple of tours. We usually played one song in Swedish. Okay, we, cho we chose one and did that in Swedish, uh, which is usually very uh, appreciated, actually. Okay, uh, but doing all of them in Swedish, we we figured it, it worked only in Sweden, Finland. Uh, now, not Finland, Norway, Denmark, and sometimes in Finland, depending on where in Finland you are. All right, sure. And uh, other than that, places where they are generally very bad at English. So it then it's okay. It, then because it's, then it's like, I yeah. I understand anyway. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so Nevada. <laughs> <laughs> well, why did I pick that place? Yeah. They're not particularly bad at English in Nevada. I wouldn't say so, no. <laughs> no, they're good at counting. <laughs> oh, yeah. You see what I mean? Because of Vegas. Uh, the, I see. Yeah, I mean, the, the hits never stop here at Amazon <laughs> History. All right, not Chris. Why don't you say goodbye to all those people in Nevada and not Nevada? All right, everyone in Nevada and not Nevada. Thank you very much for watching. Hope we'll meet again very soon. Same time, same channel, same place. Bye-bye. See ya.
right, everyone, you know the drill. You click, 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 get some subscriptions, check out Indy's other channels, become a Patreon. That's it, get the fuck out of here.